All right, so so far in trig, we have been in the following situation. We've been asked, for example, to find cosine of the angle, let's say pi over four. Well, in this case, they give us the angle and cosine of that angle we know is equal to root two over two. Now, sometimes the situation is reversed. That is, somebody could ask us to do this, find and they might write cosine. Now, they may not give you the angle, but they might write something like this. That cosine of that unknown angle is one half. So in this example, you're asked or you want to find the angle such that cosine of that angle is one half. Now, typically we don't write this cosine of blank equals one half. Here's what we usually write. The same problem will be formulated in the following way. Cosine with a little negative one here. So this is inverse cosine of one half, okay? So if in this problem right here, if you were thinking to yourself, oh, cosine of, and you came up with the angle correctly, if you came up with pi over three, okay, if that was your answer to this problem here, then your answer to this would also be pi over three. So the point is, is that nobody writes cosine of blank as one half. We write inverse cosine of one half equals pi over three. And you have to know that when somebody writes this, what you're doing is you're looking for an angle the same way you'd be looking for an angle in this uh, problem right above it. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. There are lots of angles such that cosine of the angle is one half, right? After all, there are infinite angles. How do you know that you're looking for pi over three, or why did I choose pi over three? And that is a uh, very good observation. And what we've agreed upon is that when you have the following situation, inverse sine, okay? Inverse sine of something, and when you come up with the angle theta, the agreement is that the angle lies between negative pi over two and pi positive pi over two. That's for inverse sine. For inverse cosine, when you take inverse cosine of some number and you come up with some angle like I did over here, right? I came up with the angle pi over three. The agreement is that that angle that you come up with lies between zero and pi. And the same thing is true with tangent, that we have an agreement upon what angle uh, we're gonna be getting, that is what angle lies in the range of inverse tangent. So inverse tangent of something, okay, yeah, it's some angle, but that angle has to lie between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. Okay, so what you need to know is that whenever you're looking for inverse sine of something, the output is an angle and the angle has these, restric these restrictions. For inverse sine, the angle has to lie between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. For inverse cosine, the angle has to lie between zero and pi. And for inverse tangent, the angle has to lie between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. Okay, let's try some examples making use of this. Okay, let's say we are asked to find inverse cosine of negative root three over two. Okay, I remember from the previous page that the output of inverse cosine is an angle, okay? So I'm thinking, oh, this is really an angle in disguise. So, well, what's true? This is the same thing, the same thought as this. That cosine of the angle has gotta be negative root three over two, right? That's part of it. And from what we also talked about is that the angle, because we're dealing with inverse cosine, that angle has to lie between zero and pi, okay? So you're looking for an angle that satisfies these two requirements. The angle, cosine of the angle is negative root three over two, and the angle lies between zero and pi. Okay, well, where is cosine negative? Cosine is negative in quadrants two and three, right? But if you add this restriction that the angle has to lie between zero and pi, we must want an angle in quadrant two. Now cosine, of course, if you're talking about a unit circle, cosine refers to the x-coordinate. And so we want a large x-coordinate. So we're talking about this reference angle, right? We're talking about that 
well, we're talking about this angle, but we want this reference angle to be, this is going to be pi over 6. And I know I want this reference angle to be pi over 6 because that'll give me a large x coordinate for this point. Okay? So what we're talking about is this angle, and that must therefore be, if the reference angle is pi over 6, this angle must be 5 pi over 6. And that's why inverse cosine of negative root 3 over 2 is equal to 5 pi over 6. 5 pi over 6 is the angle that satisfies these two requirements. Cosine of the angle is negative root 3 over 2, and the angle also lies between 0 and pi. Okay, let's try another one like that. Okay, so now we're asked to find <clears throat> inverse sine of sine of 8 pi over 7. So the first thing I note, note, uh, note to myself is that this is a composition of functions, right? So I'm taking inverse sine of all of this, and I think to myself, oh, wait a minute. The output of inverse sine is always an angle. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, this whole thing, because the last operation I'm performing is taking inverse sine, this whole thing is an angle. Now, what angle? Well, this is equivalent to sine of the angle is equal to, well, what, whatever's in parentheses, just like before, right? So sine of the angle is equal to all of this. That is sine of 8 pi over 7. Now, that's not the only restriction, right? Because the output is, the angle is the output of inverse sine. The angle also has to lie between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, so first of all, I think about sine of 8 pi over 7. Now, I don't know what that is, right? Because 8 pi over 7 isn't one of our uh, special angles. But I do know where 8 pi over 7 is, right? I know that it's a little more than 7 pi over 7. So if I draw in a uh, reference angle here, okay, then all the way around would be 8 pi over 7. That would make this angle right here, the reference angle, pi over 7. So this up to there is 7 pi over 7, and this would be an extra pi over 7, right? To make a total a grand angle of 8 pi over 7. Now, if I'm dealing with a unit circle, that is a circle with uh, radius 1, then I know sine of that angle. I know sine of angle is simply the y-coordinate. So if I think about this length right here, right? I can see that that y-coordinate, well, that y-coordinate, the y-coordinate of this point is going to be negative because we're in quadrant 3. So I think to myself, well, what other angle has the same y-coordinate? Because that'll tell me, you know, an angle that has the same y-coordinate as this point will have the same value for sine. Now that's relevant because we're at, we want our angle between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And that would put me either in quadrant, well, quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. So can you think of an angle in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4 that has the same, where the point has the same y-coordinate as this point? Sure, right? On the y-axis, you simply go over to this point right here. So if you think about that angle, so let's draw that in. So this angle... This angle right here is equal to that angle, and that would mean that the y-coordinates are the same, right, for these points. That is, this length is the same as that length, and they're both negative. So if this angle is pi over 7, then this angle must be pi over 7 as well. Now, of course, what's great here is that that means that we have this, right? This is the angle of interest, negative pi over 7. Now you might say, wait a minute, why did you choose that? Why didn't you just go all the way around? And the answer is because you want your angle theta to lie between uh, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And negative pi over 2 would be going this way, and positive pi over 2 would be going that way. Okay? So we wanted negative pi over 7 so that uh, this second requirement would be satisfied. And so our answer is this. The angle we're looking for is negative pi over 7. 
that is inverse sine of sine of 8 pi over 7 is equal to negative pi over 7. Now this problem illustrates an important point that simply because you have inverse sine and sine, you, simply because you have the composition of those two functions doesn't mean they simply undo each other and you simply get the angle that you started with, right? You have to think about the second restriction and that may lead you to an angle that wasn't what you started with. Okay, let's go ahead and do another example, keeping all this in mind. Okay, in this problem we're asked to write as an algebraic expression in U. And what we have here is sine of inverse tangent of U. So the first thing I thought to myself with this problem is that, that oh, in parentheses here I see it's inverse tangent of U. And I know that the inverse trig functions always give me an angle. So I first think to myself, oh, okay, what do I know? Well, that inverse tangent of U is some angle, okay? That's the meaning of the inverse trig functions is that the output is an angle. Now this is logically equivalent to tangent of the angle must be U, just like before. So tangent of the angle we're looking for is equal to U. But don't forget the restriction that the angle for inverse tangent has to lie between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, so you don't just want any old angle. You want an angle that lies, well, between negative pi, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So the angle we're thinking about, now u could be positive or negative, right? So if u is positive, well, the angle must lie in quadrant 1 because only will tangent of an angle up here be positive. In, well, tangent's positive here as well, but because we have the restriction that the angle lies between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, if u is positive, the angle must lie up here somewhere in the first quadrant. Okay? So this is one possibility, right? Theta could be up here. But the second possibility, of course, if u is negative, well, what angle do we need such that tangent is negative? Well, that would have to lie in the fourth quadrant, right? So we may have a situation like this where the angle lies in the fourth quadrant. So this could be a theta as well. So now what we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge that tangent of an angle is always y over x, right? The y coordinate divided by the x coordinate. Now what we can do is we can think of u, we can think of it as u over 1. And what I can do is say, oh, I'm going to let that u, the u be my y and the x be my 1. So I'm thinking of u as the u as y and the 1 as my x. Okay. Now what I've done, of course, is I've, I've strayed away from the unit circle. As soon as I, sa I said the x coordinate is 1 and um, and y is u, no longer is the hypotenuse of this right triangle going to be of length 1, right? Because this is of length 1 now. So, but what I can do is draw in my right triangle here. Okay, and I'd have a right triangle here as well. These are, this is another possibility for theta. And with, with this choice here, right, if x is 1, well, this would be the x-coordinate of both of these points. So the x-coordinate is 1 either way with this decision here. Now, y could be, I'm deciding y is, or u is y, okay? So the y-coordinate would be u here, and this y-coordinate would be u as well, okay? Now with those decisions, with x known and y known, can you find the hypotenuse? Of course, right? Because we know that r is equal to the square root of, well, the square of x plus the square of y. So this gives me that r must be equal to the square root of, well, x is 1, so 1 squared is 1, and y squared, well, my y is u, so it's going to be plus u squared. And so now what do we have? Well, we have our value of x, that's equal to 1. We have our value of y, we're letting that be u. And with those decisions, 
r must be the square root of 1 plus u squared. Okay, so now back to our original problem. Theta is inverse tangent of u, okay? So look what we're asked to do. Find sine of this whole angle. Well, I don't know what the angle is, but I do know that sine of the angle is always y divided by r. And I have my y and I have my r. So that means that sine of my angle, but of course my angle written as inverse tangent of u, sine of that angle is my y, which is u, divided by my r, which is the square root of 1 plus u squared. Now what's interesting about this problem is that if u is positive, well, then sine is positive, right? And if u is negative, well then the output, well then this u is negative, and then sine of that angle would be negative as well. Okay, so those are some examples of how we uh, practically work with inverse trig functions.